A small difference in talent leads to a massive difference in output and productivity and so on. And therefore, the incentives are such that if you are a staggeringly um, uh, competent or qualified or talented person, you need to be around other staggeringly talented and qualified people to, to get a full expression of, um, uh, you know, to get a full expression of your abilities. Welcome to Everything is Everything. I'm Amit. This is Ajay. Freddy's on the table today. And our producer just said rolling. And that led Ajay to a thought. Ajay, what's your thought on rolling? The word rolling today makes some sense to us because there were cans, there were canisters of film and the physical machinery of uh, movie photography involved those rotating cylinders. Today, all... Uh, video capture is digital but these words just go on so i was just thinking 100 years from now 1000 years from now will these same terms be used i'm reminded of a jerry pornell book uh, the moat in god's eye where uh, they are talking to each other about the phrase 2020 and it's a world in which enough genetic engineering has taken place and everybody has perfect vision but the phrase 2020 has persisted yeah, and I often, uh, you know, there's a term for this in design, skeuomorphic design, which is basically you design something new, but you add elements to it, which make it look like something old. For example, when uh, Apple first, I forget whether it was in the iPhone or the Macs or whatever, uh, they had uh, their books app where you could read stuff. You know, it, it looked like a physical bookshelf. So there is absolutely kind of, uh, you know, no element of that. A lot of sound mixing software will have elements of, you know, which mimic um, uh, what a physical uh, machine would look like. And the idea, of course, is you've got new technology, but you want earlier users to feel comfortable with it. So you have some design elements where even on a software, you know, you'll see a knob and uh, all and, of those And perhaps things. when enough years go by, you'd be able to think from scratch. So... Think, again, think of the metaphor, Steve Jobs' idea of pinching on a screen. Is it something fundamentally human or you know, will it be gone 100 years from now? And it's also interesting how, like in a sense, a QWERTY keyboard, you know, is almost like a random thing. That is not the optimal way of arranging uh, uh, keys for typing. But that has now become the default because once you've set a particular way of doing something, once you've set a convention, we're kind of stuck there. And that's a relatively harmless way. But I think of more harmful ways and it's something I'm, uh, I want to expand on in detail as, you know, perhaps at book length, but about how we are stuck often in sort of uh, forms of the past, even though uh, those forms originated because of particular reasons and we've now outgrown them. But that is a subject for uh, perhaps more episodes uh, down the line. Evolution shaped the optimal speed at which uh, the human mind changes its models. Okay, so the process of the world created a certain pace of change. And over a million years, over 10 million years, uh, there were certain optimizations that took place on how quickly you take to a new thing. So those features about us are deep and may well be like that for a long, long time. So Amit, tell us, what is your cool idea for today? So my cool idea, in a sense, uh, has to do with uh, why you and I spend so much time together. And how odd it is that we are in Karjat and not in some other city at this kind of uh, moment in time. And how yet it is not surprising. Uh, and I, I, I want to specifically think about how talent congregates in certain places like the software professionals in Silicon Valley, filmmakers in Bombay, all of that. But before that, I want to tell you a story. Um, when uh, a couple of years back, when Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo got the Nobel Prize with Michael Kramer, uh, Abhijit's publishers at Juggernaut said, why don't you fly to Delhi? He's just won the Nobel Prize. He can come on your podcast. Now, his coming on my podcast on the very week that I ha he had won the Nobel Prize would have been a big, uh, you know, it, it would have been uh, nice. So I said, cool, I need two hours of his time. Those days I did two hour episodes. I, I think I said I, I, I said I needed two or three hours. Um, I asked for three hours. I said minimum two. They said, no, no, he's very busy. He'll only give you one hour and so on and so forth. And I, and I said, no. So I turned down a Nobel Prize winner uh, coming on the show. And my logic was that if I get just one hour, 
I will get to, uh, I, I'll have to ask him the standard stuff about RCTs and all of that, etc, etc. But you give me two hours with him, three hours with him. And today, of course, I would insist on five hours or nothing. Uh, if, if I did that, I could go back to before I was born and to before he was born uh, and talk about, for example, the 1960s when my father was a student in Presidency College and he was taught by Deepak Banerjee, who was Abhijit's father. And how much my father, how highly my father used to think of Deepak Banerjee and I could start there. And then I could, you know, ask him about his dad, ask him about his years in Presidency College and later in JNU and later in Harvard and so on. And that's the kind of conversation I really love to have, where you can get a sense of the soul of a person and not reduce him down to one thing that they're in the public eye for. And I did write a column for Times of India um, on that. And the point I made in my column was really about talent and how, um, uh, you know, uh, creative people and competent people and uh, tend to congregate in certain clusters. And my reference for that was uh, a paper written by one of uh, Banerjee's uh, um, uh, co-Nobel Prize winners at the time, Michael Kremer. Now, a controversial point I made in that piece was that uh, Banerjee had gone to Presidency College, then to JNU and then to Harvard. And my point was, it was Harvard that was critical for his development. And for that, I turned to Kremer's paper, which is a seminal 1993 paper called The O-Ring Theory of Economic Development. And Kremer in his paper takes the, uh, uh, the example of the famous O-Ring, like in, in, the, in the 1986 Challenger uh, exploration, the disaster, the space shuttle that exploded, it was a $3.2 billion project. And the reason uh, the shuttle exploded was because of a $10 O-Ring, you know. So one little flimsy $10 thing kind of uh, failed to function the way it should and everything fell apart and etc, etc. And the point there is not the trivial point that, you know, your chain is as strong as its weakest link. Of course, we know that. There was a greater point in there about the interplay between talent, productivity and wages, right? And Kremer gives an example of this and I don't know how eloquent I'll be in describing this. So I'll, we'll also link down to a marginal revolution video on this subject by Tyler Cowen, which is fantastic and which explains this in detail. But his point is this. Let us say you have 10 people in a room who are all excellent and are performing at a level of excellent, which is 0.99. Right. And then uh, you look at their productivity when the 10 of them work together. At the end of that, what you have, if you sort of multiply by 10, which is what he was using for each of these calculations, you get a number of 9.05. If they are slightly less talented, if it's not 0.99, but 0.95, which is also incredibly talented, you get a total output of 5.99. And if they are 0.9, you know, uh, uh, better than 90% of humanity or whatever, if they are 0.9 each, you get 3.49. Right. So a small difference in talent leads to a massive difference in output and productivity and so on. And therefore, the incentives are such that if you are a staggeringly um, uh, competent or qualified or talented person, you need to be around other staggeringly talented and qualified people to, to get a full expression of, um, uh, you know, to get a full expression of your abilities. And a, a few episodes back in episode five, we spoke about Oppenheimer. Right. Now, Oppenheimer school, college, he's unhappy, he's not fitting in any way, tries to poison his physics teacher with a, uh, you know, with putting some poison in an apple. And, but then he goes to the, un the University of Gottingen. He's taught by Max Born, who you coined the term quantum mechanics. He has classmates of the caliber of Dirac and John von Neumann. And he goes to an entirely different level. And the whole point of this is that congregations of talent in a certain sense uh, are inevitable because that's the way the incentives are aligned. And what it also means is that someone who is at a skill level of 0.99 can get much, can get paid twice or thrice someone at a skill level of 0.95. Because it appears that there isn't much of a difference, but there's a huge difference. This is especially so in two use cases. One is where the quality of the work matters more than the quantity. For example, if you want to write a great novel, you're better off with one great novelist than three mediocre novelists working together. And that's where quality comes in. And two, if you have a complicated tasks with, say, you know, 10,000 links in the chain, you don't need an O-ring anywhere. Everybody has to be absolutely top quality and performing well. And therefore, this is a, one of the uh, ways in which going to Harvard, for example, is important. I mean, of course, uh, I 
completely sympathize with the view that what these great colleges give you is really credentialism i have been to harvard it it has a signaling effect and of course they do sorting for bright minds to begin with all of those things are true but equally the value of going there is that they've selected for bright minds you're meeting some of uh, the finest minds out there wherever you are uh, if you're lucky in a particular place in time like gottingen it can uh, you know just have an exponential explosion of talent and Uh, so on and that's um uh, uh, one reason that these kind of congregations happen and therefore as a policy you know if you want to attract bright people if you want to get great work out then the focus is figure out how to make this happen how to get the incentives absolutely right there's another uh, there's a writer called richard florida who coined a term called the creative class now his theory is also interesting and orthogonal to this uh, doesn't draw from this and florida's coined the term called the creative class i think his first book on this subject was an early 2000s book called rise of the creative class he wrote a couple of other books since and his point was that economic growth follows where creative uh, congregation happens so cities which are full of say entrepreneurs and um, you know artists filmmakers uh, poets and gay people lesbian people where there is that kind of diversity there is much more openness there is a much greater flourishing of talent and therefore the capital also comes there because again one consequence of talent coming together is that capital then chases that talent and then it becomes a virtuous cycle in that particular place and equally it can become a vicious cycle in in that particular place so the, i i find all of this to be a great insight and it's aligned with a concept we spoke about the other day the looking glass self that we shape ourselves based on the reflections of others and the company we keep actually shapes who we are and uh, you know that is why that's why i like to sit with you because it can only make me a better thinker and a better person but that's also why it's it's vitally important why software engineers will tend to go to silicon valley and filmmakers will tend to come to bombay and there are network effects in play there as well that you know all the entrepreneurs know that the best coders are in silicon valley and all the best coders know that you know all the startups are going to be uh, based there so again virtuous cycle in that particular place and it's it's an important question for all of us to answer especially in india it's something important for us to think about that you know we used to talk in earlier decades when i was growing up a popular term was brain drain that our kids will go to iit and then they'll go abroad and i think that's a great thing for those kids they're all making individual rational choices they should do that the question then is that why are they having to go abroad what can we do to create centers of excellence here so that people feel inspired people feel happy like in a filmmaking sense if you're filmmaking in india today and if you're hindi speaking you come to bollywood other languages you might go to the other centers but you know everybody is here if you make a film where do you go bombay is a logical place because that's where you can choose among the best editors that's where there are the cheapest studios that's where you can choose among the best technicians everything is there and that's how these congregations happen and i think in india and especially you know you've been in policy uh, for so long you've been in uh, uh, you know worked with government for so long and that's i think something that we need to get right and right now we are having the opposite effect frankly we are chasing good people away and the good people who do stay are staying in a sense almost despite the odds and that's something we need to think about seriously i have a few thoughts uh, in continuation of this um the multiplication that you were doing of you know 1 minus alpha raised to n um it's very important to think about the problem that is at hand at the other extreme the entire concept of mass manufacturing uh, with standardized parts was a way to solve that problem a car contains 10000 parts but it works flawlessly because there is an extreme level of precision engineering that has gone into it each ball bearing is guaranteed to be inside very tight tolerances so then it all becomes plug compatible and then you can separate those pieces out so i think that's an interesting insight that there's an analog and a digital when you are in a digital world it's extremely high precision a one is a one and a zero is a zero uh ball bearing is a ball bearing and there are no uh, surprises in putting these things together so i think that's one piece of the puzzle that we are able to achieve great ladders of complexity 
when we are guaranteed this plug compatibility uh, in software we do that a lot around creating apis and then there is an api call and that damn thing had better just work and i don't want to know how it was done and that's how we uh, protect ourselves from that complexity so this is the first thing to think about that the world is shades of gray i think maybe a movie is an example of a problem where there are hundreds of people who come together to build a movie and the relationships between each worker and each producer are highly imprecise and poorly defined so that's the opposite of what i'm describing as a car or a tank or a plane where there are guaranteed components or in software where there is an api call and it has to work and it's testable it's a black box so then you can separate out two people and they don't need to talk to each other because there's a defined interface around which they will connect my second idea is that there has been a great deal of improvement on cross border collaboration on global teams i have been part of many teams so i want to tell you a funny story uh, my good friend ahim zailais is a statistician in vienna uh, he and ila patnaik and i wrote our first paper without having ever met okay we just uh, struck up a conversation over uh, mailing lists and the internet and we realized we were chasing different pieces of a correlated puzzle and we came together to solve it and we got a beautiful paper done in my opinion one of the nice papers of my life and only later we met and we started talking and it was great but we got all the way to our first paper without even video calls just on email and svn so we were collaborating on an internet scale and we were able to do very interesting things now in that uh i have two things to add one that is fairly well known one that is less known the fairly well known is you do need human rapport okay so i think all remote teams are doing this combination of meeting up occasionally and then going off into your cave and doing things alone so the play of distance work of work from home of people from india connecting up into global teams there has been this evolution where keep people come together and you've got to understand each other and i've got to know that you will always talk trash and i've got to not get rattled and not get worried about the things that you say and then i know that 15 seconds later you'll come back to a serious note but if you've never met in person humor is so dangerous it can just be misunderstood or then we are all automatons you know we are writing uh, horrible chat gpt language and it has no human flavor which is also dull and uninteresting my third uh, comment in that is i feel that there are real limitations in contracting so imagine if you would break up a creative process into two parts part one is that you and i agree we're going to work together and you know we are on the decision making process the resource allocation process the sharing that you will do this part i will do this part okay so there is a, a planning and management and uh, an agreement stage where either orally or in writing we are arriving at a contract and then we will go off into our respective caves and implement i think that the early stage really requires people to know each other and to trust each other and i feel that today a lot of the magic of london and new york and cambridge massachusetts lies in the fact that there are these congregations of people who are able to create coalitions of working together either contractually or non contractually and then afterwards the word work can happen in a more remote way and it can happen all over the world so i just want to go back to the question of how daunting is it how difficult is it for a person to build a life away from the uh, areas of congregation and i want to start at ramanujan okay so ramanujan was in a remote corner of tamil nadu and then came his breakthrough where he went to work with hardy and you cannot imagine the story of ramanujan playing out without his going to hardy so that's one example where something amazing was built and developed by ramanujan on his own he did not become despondent saying that because i'm not at cambridge i can't create okay ramanujan started rebuilding the mathematics of the 19th century 
because he was completely cut off from the mathematics of the world okay and then it did happen to him that he got connected into the mathematics of the 20th century so that's an example where amazing things happened at a distance and then there are so many examples of people who have been away from the brainstream uh, from the mainstream and have actually built themselves and fostered knowledge and innovation one of the ideas at the university of chicago in the early years was that because it was away from the great universities of the east coast it was actually able to foster independence of thinking and a distinctive point of view and you know a lot of the greatness of u chicago in the 20th century came because it was not part of the fashion and there was greater room for free thinking uh when you go to the humanities and the social sciences it is particularly important to have authenticity in science technology engineering management in stem there is greater universality and people all over the world are pursuing similar problems but when you come to understanding human beings and human society in the humanities and the social sciences then uh, being inside your subject and being closer to your subject matters greatly so there again i feel that it is enormously better to be in india and try to study in india to try to study india rather than being far away because your sources and materials are at hand so i feel that being in india you are constantly inside your subject matter and you are invisibly picking up knowledge every day so i've had the occasion of being abroad uh, for a variety of stints and i felt a certain emptiness coming about because i was away from my subject and my source matter so i think that there are many many aspects where that congregation happens and is powerful and yet we should not see it as make or break there are many many aspects in which actually there is plenty of upside and people will create people will invent and uh, great things can happen almost anywhere so i have a ramanujan like example and in fact you were speaking earlier that you know you thought of ramanujan because we last night over dinner we were discussing vishy anand right and vishy anand is an outlier of that sort and i use the term outlier carefully uh let me i want to put in context for everyone who is sort of viewing this uh, what a staggering mind and what a staggering genius anand is in terms of what he actually managed to achieve and to put that into perspective let's talk about uh, you know a system that was put together to have great minds congregate and learn in a systematic way which was a soviet school of chess right now uh, decades ago there used to be a gentleman named nikolai krilenko who was a top soviet functionary who once said we must finish once and for all with the neutrality of chess we must condemn once and for all the formula chess for the sake of chess like the formula art for art sake we must organize shock brigades of chess players and big begin immediate realization of a five year plan for chess stop quote <laughs> and i think he must have said this in the 30s but he could not have said this in a future decade because stalin got rid of him in 1938 he was purged <laughs> right five year plan for chess now this is a well known thing that in the soviet union they wanted to show that they were superior to other nations other civilizations etc and their way of doing that was by showing their dominance in chess as one way of you know this is a game of the brain and all that so chess was taught in schools the way math is taught in schools uh, and that's the way the whole system was built and what that did was you had a massive sample size of kids exposed to chess so it was easy to pick out talent from there and right from there all the way to the gm level um, you know you had systematic training and all of that and the soviet school of chess however doesn't refer to the this system as it were a physical school or university it refers to a way of thinking about chess where they figured out all the heuristics and they taught all their kids how to think about the game strategically positionally etc etc and a great example of this i wrote this feature on vishwanathan anand a few years ago for um, uh, espn and th there was a great example of this which my good friend our good friend devangshu datta had given me devangshu played serious chess uh, at the national level for india in the 1980s very close friend of anand as well and uh, this is what devangshu said to me when he was talking about his early experience as a player he said when i started playing east europeans 
in the 1980s. The difference in chess culture was stark. We knew so much less it wasn't funny. To take an analogy, it was like putting a bunch of talented kids with a basic knowledge of, say, self-taught HSC level maths into direct competition with people who had post-grad math degrees. We'd struggle through the opening and hit the middle game and start wondering what to do. And then in the post-mortem, the opponent would say, oh, my trainer taught us that with this structure, you have to play this way. And you'd be like, shit. Yeah. Which means so, they were. I want to uh, continue on this with an inside joke in the field of chess. Uh, the inside joke is the phrase, as every Russian schoolboy knows. Okay? <laughs> yeah. This is a phrase that chess people understand that things that may appear deep and complex to you and me are actually common knowledge to Russian schoolboys. And it's a phrase that has actually gone far beyond chess into many other contexts to convey this huge gap between the people who've been picking up this stuff in the hands of a talented coach or a parent from childhood. And in middle age or in the peak of their performance, they have an edge that others can only dimly perceive. Yeah. So this was the Soviet school of chess. All your top grandmasters were from the Soviet Union, which is why, you know, the fischer spassky match of 1973 is so seminal because you had an American player come and just a brilliant genius, of course, on his own and actually get to the top. But otherwise, the Soviets dominated and even after the Soviet Union broke up, you, Soviet bloc players were still kind of dominant. And along comes Anand in the late 80s when the Soviet Union still stands and he's this young teenager. And again... Uh, what was important for Anand was in his formative years, he was in, I think, the Philippines and uh, so not in India, where they had a regular chess program on TV. And from what I remember, you know, they'd give puzzles at the end of every program and he would always send the right answer and get a lot of books and all of that. And I, if I remember correctly, once they called him and said, look, you're winning everything, just stop entering. We'll give you all the chess books you want once and for all. But anyway, so he came back from India with that backing. And then, of course, he later went on to become an insp inspirational for generations of Indian players. And now India is... Uh, chess superpower and that's something we can uh, maybe discuss in the future and discuss separately but he was he was at such an incredible disadvantage because he didn't have the training that people in the soviet school did he had incredible powers of calculation incredible intuition that he was building gradually but he didn't have an advantage of that base and for him to dominate to become one of the top players in the world and much later to become world champion the the metaphor i draw for it is like someone taking a maruti 800 into a formula 1 race and winning the damn thing like it is just a staggering achievement. It's like winning Wimbledon today with a wooden racket, right? Uh, and a, a Ramanujan kind of example, where he didn't initially have that congregation, but then he built it later. Like, you know, you pointed out la last night at dinner as well, that, you know, a, a significant part of his playing life was in Spain, and he had his team there, other masters, other grandmasters. Today, of course, you have those congregations online. But where I would push back is that I would say that, yes, for the sake of morale, we should constantly tell ourselves that we don't need that to succeed. You know, we can succeed without congregations and all of that if we are as brilliant as Ramanujan or Anand. But one, very few people are. And two, uh, there are uh, countless Ramanu Ramanujans and Anands who have been lost to us, who are unseen because they never even, because they couldn't buck that. They couldn't, uh, you, you know, they didn't even uh, manage to sort of get that far. So I see them as outliers almost as exceptions uh, that sort of uh, prove the rule. I don't deny that. I, I just want to say that the extent to which it, the Indian middle class parent sees this as make or break is a bit overstated. Okay, There's plenty to be done, particularly with in the modern age, access to books, access to the internet has changed the journey of knowledge. So in STEM subjects, you're playing a global game. And uh, there are congregations where the conversations happen. And I will suggest that the contracting is a bigger problem than the actual work. So there are hybrid models that as long as you're able to overcome the contracting problem and become part of teams, then being away is much more feasible than it ever was. And then I will push part two, which is that if your thing is uh, the humanities and social sciences, then really authenticity is king. That to know Indian economics, you really need to be in India because you're building intuition every day. Every conversation, every scene that your eye sees feeds your knowledge. And when you are not there, you're fundamentally cut off. So in that sense, 
to take movies as an example you have to be in bombay to do bollywood because there is the conversation there is that culture there is that design process there is the invention process much like south california does all the car design of the world it's only in bollywood that a certain genre of movies happens and if you are not part of that conversation you are not tapping into the state of the art of that knowledge and you are not understanding what is the innovation that what is that next thing that i can do so my mental model is there are many many uh, great sucking sounds where these congregation effects are happening um i also want to talk a little bit about india so now think uh the way india has shaped up there are actually gigantic migration flows happening in precisely the ways in which that you have described i feel that all over india uh there are people who grow up with a uh, curiosity about science and become an engineer and then they're going to bangalore and pune and bombay and madras and uh hyderabad and kerala these are the great collections of engineering minds that are happening and they are sucking in people from all over the country i've heard many people say something remarkable that the united states is the world's number one engineering workforce you want to hire 500 high quality engineers okay the place to go to is the us and it many many locations in the us you will be able to assemble a team of 500 high quality engineers the world's second best location for that now is india that the sheer depth of engineering talent in many many fields is quite something and the numbers are out of the world so when you take the top end of the distribution and multiply by 1.4 billion you're getting to a very high critical mass so if you want a cute 20 man team you're okay in finland but if you want 2000 people you'll come to india because the depth of the bench is phenomenal so i want to sort of focus on the bollywood point and i don't know what our producer vartika would sort of think about this but i think of bollywood as yes a place of great opportunity but also bombay is a place where dreams come uh, where dreams come to die and art comes to be corrupted i did an episode with roshan abbas and vikram sathe a while back of the scene and the unseen it was a year end episode for last year and vikram told me and both of them have plenty of experience in this industry and vikram told me about how he he'll you know meet these talented kids and they come from some small town in maharashtra and they're steeped into culture they're reading vijay tendulkar and they are like deep into local forms and and, and they're really smart brilliant intelligent people and then they come to bombay where they are meeting with really shallow people who are you know talking in a particular way and a year later you know vikram will run into someone at a party who the previous year was discussing vijay tendulkar with him and this guy will be like dude how you doing let's go chill and you know you'll be in that shallow jargon because these people suddenly feel at that inferiority complex uh, you know verni is a pejorative term in uh, uh, in our cities uh, when i was growing up it was uh, whereas a vernacular is something we should celebrate and everything kind of becomes mainstreamed and homogenized in certain ways and there is a counter force to this you know i did an episode of the scene in the unseen almost exactly a year back with uh, vinay singhal who runs uh, uh, this app called stage.in and vinay described stage to me as netflix for india but netflix for bharat but that doesn't mean it was netflix in languages like hindi punjabi and all of that it was netflix for india in dialects so all his content is haryanvi bhojpuri and now i think rajasthani or whatever but they they are dialects now there's an interesting thing happening here what do cities often do which is a problem when it comes to languages they homogenize right so let's say um, you're somewhere in central india you're really good at bhojpuri or maithili or any of these wonderful dialects but you go to a city where everyone is speaking hindi and then you want to conform you want to fit in you don't want to be a verni so you lose your dialect and therefore as urbanization happens which we both agree is like just fantastic and the the reason for all human progress what all one of the side effects is that homogenization happens you can lose dialects you can lose subcultures however technology and capitalism have now enabled a move away from that as well where you can keep all of these alive and what vinay found was vinay described something which he called the reverse migration from bollywood he would say that haryanvi kids would earlier say mujhe filmmaker banna hai editor banna hai ye banna hai wo banna hai they go to bombay and now he says they are coming back and i forget the size of the industry he mentioned some 3000 uh, people who are now a haryanvi film industry making content in haryanvi and i'm sure it's grown since then and he was you know and all the traditional venture capitalists and so 
on said hey what are you talking about never going to work right but uh, he charged netflix rates and uh, they have i think 300000 subscribers by now or some insane number and now the vcs are flocking to them they had a big round of funding last year and it's phenomenal and this brings me to my other point that earlier what would happen is these congregations of talent and creative people and incentives and all that would happen because of geography you're congregating together in the same place but now what i realize more and more is that to some extent and we can discuss this in detail in our episode on cities when we do that but to some extent this can have this can be enabled by technology why are cities great cities are great because they bring people together and uh, you know um, create those networks um, um, of of talent of markets all of that and to some extent technology and the internet can also do that though not to that same extent because you and i meeting in person is really different from you and i meeting online you and i meeting online means we can have a kind of an agenda we are working together on something you and i meeting offline means that in the evening you know when the rain is beautiful the green is fluorescent we can go out in the garden we can have a beer together and in that banter something can emerge thoughts can emerge we can take digressions and go down side paths and expand both of our brains and uh, um that is still missing but i would say that you know i agree with you on the optimism and energy that every individual should bring into trying to make something of themselves because we have the technology and the internet and the access today available to us but at the same time if i shift the lens to governments to uh, policy makers i would say you also need to figure out ways that you can create good incentives good conditions for the creative class to get together as florida would say and for talent to sort of uh, congregate in the ways that uh, kramer would have imagined so i think we, we are on common ground uh, there are centrifugal and centripetal forces so there are there are engineers from hindi heartland who are fleeing the hindi heartland and coming to the great engineering centers of india but that doesn't mean that all of them will show up in silicon valley uh, by the way when you said that most of bollywood is uh, crass shallow bullshit but that's because 99% of everything is crass shallow bullshit <laughs> so i could take you into the indian startup world and most of it is rubbish i could take you into the silicon valley startup world and most of it is rubbish so no but uh, that sturgeon's law that 98% of everything is crap but my point was different my point was let a good person who is who can do great work will come to bollywood and produce crap because there is there are incentives for mediocrity so, so I, i was just about to say that you do need those that minimum critical mass and the economies of scale to get together that minimum 10 20 man team without which there is no movie then you're down to uh, uh trivial production projects like some youtube podcast with an eclectic name everything is everything okay that's what you can do with essentially no teams but if you want to make a movie you'd need a team that is bigger than that and there is a minimum critical mass below which it just won't arise so you do need those little agglomerations you may not need a bollywood scale agglomeration so you know there may maybe no engineering culture in uh, bhopal but there is an engineering culture in pune okay and so on so there is a minimum economy of scale at which point things can take off so i am in that middle road that you do need agglomerations we need each other talking to each other is one of the most important things that happens to us and i wouldn't overstate that giant sucking sound i'm not reverential about silicon valley as the only place where all the bright ideas are congregated we need a million silicon valleys which is what I, but you know what you know you're a very nice guy you've been very nice to me but uh, we should also be nice to our producer and collaborator and partner in crime vartika yeah. and you just kind of i think made her feel so bad because you were like i thi bombay pahunch gayi karjat <laughs> you know which is <laughs> nahi karjat ko bhi hum bombay banayenge <laughs> Uh, just that it's a three man team and you know we couldn't have made a movie if, even if we wanted so ajay bahut ho gayi bari bari baatein vara pav khate as it were but tell me a little bit about your t-shirt i like your t-shirt man it says the tibet museum and there is some script on it that i can't quite read and there are clouds and there is a nice tall building i really like this t-shirt man um i was there uh, this is uh, in mcleod ganj Uh, which is just about dharamshala uh, i visited the tibet museum and 
it is a really great museum i encourage everybody to go there lots of museums in india are not done well this one is done well and it tells the history of tibet and it does a fantastic job it has the artifacts you can see objects and it really triggers off the mind but equally interesting was the fact that it sits inside a complex of government buildings okay and that government is called the central tibet administration okay which i found incredibly interesting this is a government in exile okay you read about these things in the history books there was a french government in exile that was in london during the second world war and things like that but here you have a living breathing government in exile so that's my reason too for everybody please visit mcleod ganj and walk around the lanes of the cta it's a government in exile and it makes you think about government uh, as an indian i was so happy and i was so proud that india has been kind to tibetan refugees and that this central tibet uh, administration is sitting on indian soil and i feel you know our first human impulse should always be to be kind to refugees and take in refugees and i'm so proud that we as india have been good to these people in many ways all through these decades even sometimes when it has been quite costly for uh, the country but then it got me thinking that uh, currently the cta is funded by donations they have no coercive power they have no taxation so they've got all these tidy structures there is a building it's a ministry of finance there's a ministry of home i think i think they call it department of home and department of finance and uh, they're funded by donations they have no coercive power they play some role in organizing the global tibetan community but it is a wannabe state and i wondered is this useful training wheels to actually become a state one day okay so imagine that one day uh, tibet becomes free is cta the institutional raw material around which you could envision this becoming uh, the raw material around which a new government in tibet can come across can, can come about okay at first it sounds interesting and it sounds plausible and that may be why the chinese get so irritated that there are these structures in india i thought a bit about it and uh, i have uh, uh, two three things to say okay so step 1 i think that no amount of being a wannabe state like structure with these nice tidy buildings for what is actually a philanthropic organization funded by uh, donations no amount of these structures are a real training wheel for the problem of coercive power coercive power is a poison you're fundamentally a nice guy when you are asking for donations and you're performing some activities and you have no coercive power and it may even run in the wrong direction because it may lull the persons inside these organizations into a certain isomorphic mimicry into a certain complacence that yeah yeah we're ready we've got a department of finance we've got a department for home and we know how to do this stuff and we're all ready and so i'm not impressed or convinced that this is a meaningful prep that you you don't develop state capability without actually fighting with the battle of the evil that is coercive power until that you're just a nice guy and it's very nice easy to be a good organization uh the that leads to the second question which is very well when big things happen uh on the international scale so when you think on the scale of 100 years when you think on the scale of 1000 years countries are ephemeral countries come and go the border is nothing sacred it's a line on the map and things change so how has it worked how has it been where new states have come up and new states have fared well versus new states have come up and new states have fared badly okay new states have fared badly over and over and over so if you look back at the great post colonial experiment all over the world many poor countries got freedom for the first time and by and large it worked out badly uh, it worked out really badly where there had been a freedom movement armed with guns okay and as 
you have said about gandhi ji he got one big thing right which was ahimsa that uh, you respond to violence by turning the other cheek and that was one simple piece of magic that we in india got at the outset we see so many other countries where there was a violent military movement to try to obtain freedom and that goes badly because once again once you've unleashed the violence it doesn't go away and it changes the people it leads for the wrong kind of person to bubble up to the top so in in a well functioning state what you want is a certain kind of decency you want a philosopher king and uh, violent movements bubble up successful military generals who are rarely philosopher kings so the countries that just got started with a military movement generally did badly okay very well can we point to some examples where a new country got its act together and did rather well or where there was a great change in the uh, arrangement of the nation and the boundaries and it all worked out very well and the best stories of this nature are in eastern europe so the easiest of all the transitions was east germany when east germany merged into west germany it inherited all the west german institutions so it got everything on a platter they had understood liberal democracy which is not just a business of having elections every 5 years it is about constitutionalism it is about a constitutional morality it is about the rule of law it is about checks and balances it is about being imbued with a certain decency and creating the arrangements through which a certain kind of person bubbles up into positions of power and influence and all these difficult things had been figured out in west germany so east germany got this on a red carpet and literally overnight east germany got that institutional package and east germany flourished now it remains true that east germany is the backwaters of unified germany okay so these things don't go away the inequality between east germany and west germany has not gone away so it's a bit like a north india south india problem that problem will be there for a long long time the north of italy has been cosmopolitan and advanced and prosperous and the south of italy has been a hinterland and mafia violence and so on for hundreds of years so these problems don't go away quickly but east germany fully graduated into the german institutional package and got a giant leap away from the cruelty and impoverishment of the old east germany into a modern prosperous decent civilized country so that is number one okay then you look at the rest of eastern europe and the baltic republics they also did extremely well and now this is more interesting because they did not get the institutional package from a west germany they had to actually build these institutions from scratch and what helped them in my opinion was three things one was that they had lived in communism and they knew how bad that was so they wanted to run far away from it i remember once i was in warsaw and i heard this story where they uh, took the building that was the office of the communist party okay which was the biggest and most powerful structure of the entire city and they turned it into the stock exchange because they were making a statement that we are finished with this stuff and we now want to learn to be a capitalist country and it also helped greatly that they all became members of the european union and the european union carries with it 20000 pages of draft laws and treaty restrictions so in a way they were corralled and there are certain mistakes they could not make so uh, east europe really triumphed by and large uh, with two main exceptions Hungary is still doing pretty badly Poland is doing medium bad but the rest of the countries have really blossomed and they're doing great and so that was another place where there was a fundamental regime change and these countries in many cases came to life from scratch and found their feet and developed very beautiful modern capable advanced civilized liberal democratic states so these are the success stories and then of course you have the very big failure story and that is russia so uh, we talk a lot about the abrupt economic liberalization of russia where uh, jeff sachs and others tried to push a big leap of privatizing the companies and 
asking markets to come to exist overnight but not enough attention was paid to the state and there's no running away from that you need the state you need liberal democracy you need freedom and freedom is coded into laws and state institutions if you have unchecked state violence in those state institutions then it's never going to work so when you think of china really the best hope for china is that the institutional dna and capability of taiwan will play a role in china's future not the cta that i don't think the cta will be a great part of what will happen to china in the deep future finally turning to india um there is a small version of this story that has actually played out many times which is how do you establish a new government organization okay and all government organizations are coercive creatures so you're going to wield coercive power how will you do it so imagine somebody says for the first time i'm going to set up the fss ai the food safety uh, regulator of india if you pass a law and one fine day you suddenly create an organization of five people and one pun and the law is notified and these people are wielding coercive power it tends to work, go badly because an immense burden is placed upon a fledgling agency and the load bearing capacity is inadequate and that creates an organizational rout that organization goes into firefighting from day 3 and it never recovers from the firefighting it is just one big mess because it fails to have rule of law in the beginning then you get all the wrong incentives of the people lobbying and pushing to do special favors at a transaction level and that becomes institutional dna that kind of discretionary power then attracts the wrong people you get the wrong kind of appointments so even if in the early days there were some really wonderful people in that organization it goes downhill as that institution flexes its muscles exercising coercive power it gets the wrong kind of people at the leadership and the quality of that institution goes downhill so there's a similar training wheels question that how would you launch a brand new organization in india that is going to wield coercive power most indian experiences of this nature have worked out badly but i think we do know a bit about how to think about this and how to do it and it is a bit of a cta uh, i think that the correct idea is to understand that building an organization takes time in india it has been understood that building a bridge takes time okay so when we want to launch a bridge we will have some project management there'll be many many people who will do various pieces and then two years later five years later a uh, minister will come for the ribbon cutting but nobody expects a zero day lag between the decision to have a bridge and the bridge i think we should think of a government organization similarly that when you decide to have a food safety regulator we should recognize that it's like building a bridge it will need an organization it will need organizational design it will need drafting processes it will need training of all the individuals to live within those processes it will need building it systems it will need very careful review 20 times to understand have we got enough check and balance on all the aspects of course the power then notify a little bit of power start doing a few trivial low complexity kinds of transactions and then notify the full law where the full thing is up and running this is the structured systematic process through which new organizations should be started for those who are interested the closest we got to this kind of planning was in the early establishment of the IBBI the insolvency and bankruptcy board of india where uh, dr m sahu and then ravi narayan led the process of writing that project plan of writing a good project plan through which over a two year period you would get the high quality bankruptcy regulator unfortunately this was not used much in reality the law was notified and overnight five people were expected to perform so it's not a great story after that document was built but that document is particularly important because it's a project plan of how to create an organization that will wield some coercive power and that's a big milestone in india's journey here's sort of my question that first it's fascinating that you know uh, the the tibetan exiles should actually it's impressive but also uh, sort of poignant in a sense that they should have you know all these different ministries finance health whatever all, all there when actually 
they cannot possibly look anything like what they would look in an actual free Tibet. It's really a kind of play acting which is poignant. It's admirable that they want to learn how all of these function and they want to do that play acting. Yeah. So but, when Charles de Gaulle hmm. led uh, the French government in exile in London, I don't know this adequately, but I doubt if he tried to set up a department of health and all that. He was just focused on one thing, that how to free, get to a free France. Yeah, because the business of government is so incredibly messy with so many different stakeholders that it becomes a huge problem. And when you speak of the importance of actually engaging with reality, I would imagine that then institution building within a country would get easier as you go along because you get better at it, you're engaging with reality all the time. But in the narrative that um, uh, you laid out, uh, what I seem to get is that institution building in India has consistently been horrible and maybe you have a few exceptions and they work out, but it's consistently been horrible and I would imagine that to inevitably be the case because of the way the incentives are aligned, number one, and the be way that power inevitably corrupts and therefore I would imagine and I'm putting this as perhaps a provocative question that is it then an inevitability that all institutions must degrade from wherever they are no matter how noble they become uh, uh, no matter how noble the beginnings no uh, the DNA of the institution lies in the law and in the invisible infrastructure of constitutional protections and the judicial branch the law creates arbitrary power or the law creates checks and balances. It is possible to write better laws through which there are sufficient checks and balances and governance mechanisms through which that poison of coercive power, through which that nuclear reactor of coercive power is then surrounded by sufficient cladding. And in fact, then you get on a learning curve where experience feeds back into better working of the institution. That's the journey of advanced democracies. That's the journey of flourishing democracies and successful countries. And we in India are not on that journey because those laws are, by and large, badly drafted. Most of our Indian laws are based on an optimistic reading of human beings. So arbitrary power is willingly and recklessly conferred upon the shoulders of uh, state personnel and then it does become the lighter knee that you describe but it no, doesn't have to be that way it doesn't have to be but in India that's what I find because like you correctly said the rules of the game matter yeah. like I both of us agree that an ideal system is a, is a system in which it doesn't matter if the worst most yeah. wild person you can think of rises to power because they can't do much harm there are checks and balances but, and but so I just on. want to say this in a positive way in mm. India better rules will matter so it's a matter of writing those laws in better ways. Yeah, now, but except except that the constitution is what we have, the laws are what we have, right? If the constitution was to be amended today by those in power, it would be amended, in fact, in a worse direction. So, so let's stick to parliamentary so, law for right now, hmm. that the parliament wrote the law that created the IBBI. And I'm happy to tell you the long story. But in short, there was a whole bunch of the correct ideas and the checks and balances inside that draft law at an early stage. But later on, they were all dispensed with. And there is an intellectual failure and a conceptual failure in the Indian policy community on these basics. So this is a place where I'm actually full of hope that uh, we need to talk about these things. We need to disseminate these ideas. So the book that Vijay Kelkar and I wrote is fundamentally around this, that we need to understand public choice theory, that bestowing coercive power on an organization can easily go bad and the solution lies in checks and balances. And so the grand debate we should be having with each other is what are the appropriate checks and balances for each organization. Mostly in India today, we are at the more primitive level of a great man theory that we see a malfunctioning organization and we want a better CEO. And that's just low understanding of the complexities of organizations. Yeah, I mean, I just feel that, you know, uh Two things. One is that power inevitably corrupts and the rules of the game are written in such a way that our uh, our state is designed to rule us and not serve us. It is really a continuation of the colonial state and those are the rules of the game. That is a constitution, that is a system we are under and it's it seems mighty hard to change. And my second sort of point would be that you are full of hope in the sense that 
you are kind of saying that things are so bad it can only get better you know and 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 i buy that and we should be full of hope because and i'm also full of hope in the sense that this is an intellectual project okay 100 years ago a whole bunch of people the uh, chattering classes like you and me used to sit around and argue about a hypothetical world when the british left what was free india going to look like okay and in that intellectual project they made many mistakes they did not understand the concept of a state they thought that the state will be led by good people like gandhi ji and nehru okay they were wrong the state will attract the most venal persons particularly when the state commands coercive power and today we we should be on that intellectual journey of understanding those checks and balances and as those capabilities deepen in the country okay it turns into a program for action the, there will be a day in the future where there will be uh, the public outcry saying agency x is failing badly how do we do better at that point there should be the knowledge and the community about solving these problems so we are in that r&d phase of figuring out what a successful prosperous india would look like a few years ago when um, uh, uh, before gst came in i'd written an essay on gandhi ji's dandi salt march and one of the things that people are surprised to realize is that the tax on salt at the time and i'm i'm sure even today with gst was far more in independent india than it was under the british empire so that alone tells you that our freedom struggle such as it is is deeply incomplete <laughs> Very well, Amit. We are at the end of our fun conversation of today. What's your recommendation this week? So, in previous weeks, I've spoken about uh, you know Frederick Bassia, my uh, great hero, and uh, after whom Freddie is named, and all he's also named after Freddie Hayek. So, like two two Freddies, he carries both of them within him. And my other great hero, apart from Bassia, in terms of lucid writing, is George Orwell. who i think like bassia also died at 49 if i'm not mistaken which is my age right now so may i somehow reach the end of december i'll be very happy uh but um, but what i want to recommend of orwell is not any of his famous novels animal farm or 1984 but his collected essays like one of my treasured volume is a volume of his collected essays which really is also a chronologically uh, which is also a chronological look at Orwell the thinker because what it does is it has him in, it has his work in chronological order all the articles he wrote all the book reviews he wrote etc etc so in the last years of his life and he's feverishly working he's like the classic newspaper hack where he's doing like three pieces a week four pieces a week except that he's not a hack he's a great lucid writer you know whenever as an editor whenever a young writer would come and write for me i would ask him to read george orwell's great essay politics in the english language okay. which is such a primer on clear writing and uh, i love it so much and orwell's essays are a demonstration of that clear writing so one little thing that i do whenever i get stuck whenever i would get stuck i don't write so much these days but whenever i'd i'd get stuck writing a column or meeting a deadline and my brain would be like mush nothing is coming to my head lord help me I'm sinking into quicksand i'd pick up orwell's book and i read two or three pieces and it doesn't matter what they are about right it doesn't matter what they are about or what the subject is or what the context is or even whether i agree with him it's the clarity of his language the way he uses words the rhythms uh, that he builds that you know would free something within me so i'd read like a few pages of orwell and then i would find that my thinking would become better my language would become better and i want to make a point here that orwell makes and that i keep making to my writing students and this is super important which is that writing and thinking are related right and they're not related in the obvious way that if you're a clear thinker you are likely to be a clear writer of course you're likely a but they it works the other way around as well that if you force yourself to write clearly you are forced to think better because you cannot hide behind you know abstract words or vague jargon or you know the way many academics do like whenever i read something full of obfuscatory language i know that person is full of shit right because if you have something of value to say you will be able to see it clearly if you are a clear thinker you will be able to write clearly and writing is such a great way to sort of 
also sharpen your own thinking like when i sit down to write a piece it tells me what are the holes in my argument what are the gaps in my knowledge what do i need to do to get better sometimes i will change my mind or i will sharpen my thinking while i am writing you know john didion once said i don't know what i think until i write it down yeah. right and such a amazing essay i must recommend her book sometime as well or yeah. just like follow them in the show notes she's a great writer you know deidre mcclosky said that it is not that you have to um, i forget his exact words so i'm paraphrasing but deidre mcclosky great economist great writer once said that it is you, it's not that research has to come before the writing the writing is research yeah. right and this is not just true of non fiction writing where you're making an argument and you will figure out that oh this is a information i have to get it's true of fiction writing is true of personal essays yeah. writing can be such a great process of self discovery yeah. and this is something that orwell understands so well that writing and thinking are so clearly related and because he was such a powerful clear thinker all his life and a powerful clear writer all his life they feed into each other in a virtuous cycle so that's my recommendation for the week yeah and i'd like to say that this to every stem researcher there is a beautiful case study a story on the web where the great novelist cormac mccarthy edited a scientific paper wow and it is so lovely watching him fix up and clean up that language i mean cormac mccarthy is a great master of language and watching his brain working on fixing up how you write a research paper is a delight i'm going to recommend another book then why not uh, deidre mcclosky also wrote this great book called the economical uh, economical writing or the economical way of writing or whatever we'll link uh, you can see the cover and we'll link it in the show notes and uh, again a great book and the specific focus is how do you write about economics in clear language for the for the lay person mm. and it's not just about economics it's about any complicated subject like my writing students will often you know come from a particular background where they're studying sociology they're studying anthropology and their head is full of jargon and it's like how do i um, uh, you know write this in clear language which everyone can understand because mm. within their own field the incentives are you got to get papers published in certain journals you got to yeah. signal you're an insider good podcast should be like a window pane <laughs> yeah that refers to always great for uh, quote that uh, you know uh, good prose should be like a window yeah. pane but on, just... on orwell I, i want to sell that book to everybody um yes it's essays but it's george orwell okay so he plays at a different level altogether i remember somewhere in there he slips into a little poem okay he's he's just written a poem inside one of those essays and it's this beautiful poem i am remembering some lines from it um uh, it is forbidden to dream again we may my hopes or hide them the horses are made of chromium steel and little fat men shall ride them he's talking about what it felt like to be in the 30s insane memory and we were talking about gandhi recently in a recent episode orwell also has this great passage on gandhi in one of the last essays he wrote mm -hmm. and i'm just going to read that out because you you realize what a beautiful writer and thinker he is mm -hmm. saints should always be judged guilty until they are proved innocent but the tests that have to be applied to them are not of course the same in all cases in gandhi's case the questions one feels inclined to ask are to what extent was gandhi moved by vanity by the consciousness of himself as a humble naked old man sitting on a praying mat and shaking empires by sheer spiritual power and to what extent did he compromise his own principles by entering politics which of their nature are inseparable from coercion and fraud to give a definite answer one would have to study gandhi's acts and writings in immense detail for his whole life was a sort of pilgrimage in which every act was significant but this partial autobiography which ends in the 1920s is strong evidence in his favor all the more because it covers what he would have called the unregenerate part of his life and reminds one that inside the saint or near saint there was a very shrewd able person who could if he had chosen have been a brilliant success as a lawyer and administrator or perhaps even a businessman stop code and this is from his review of one of gandhi's books perhaps yeah. um, uh, uh, you know i forget which one but uh, you know it's from a book review and it's such a lovely passage yeah uh, george orwell is so much more alive and important to all of us today now that we know that history did not end and now that 1984 is approaching yes. so ajay what book do you recommend for this week I want to build on the O-ring theory and that conversation in development, and uh, suggest the book "The Elusive Quest for Growth" by William Easterly. It's a bit dated, but it gets the basics. So, every faddish uh, nonsense idea in development uh, 
has exerted damage and William Easterly does a good first cut of knocking out a lot of that rubbish from our brains and then we are left asking so then what that what is our theory of development what is our theory of growth and in a way everybody should read William Easterly to get away from all the silly fads most of modern development and philanthropy continues to be in the grip of those kinds of wrong ideas so there's plenty of debunking waiting to be done and uh, i've only read one book by uh, easterly which is of course his classic uh, book the white man's burden yes. you know why the west efforts to aid the rest have done so much ill and so m- so little good so just again a fantastic clear writer a, yeah. you know great thinker yeah. So on that note you know thank you for watching uh, the uh, please remember to like and subscribe and we'll see you again next friday